Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our second um, Hopeful Future seminar um, titled Rethinking the Structures of the Present for a Different Future. Um, my name is Simon Morton. I'm a research fellow at the University of the West of England. Um, I am a white man in my late 30s. I'm wearing dark green glasses and got a big ginger beard and dark green t-shirts and I will be chairing today's um, session. So before I begin I just want to kind of uh, do a little bit of housekeeping um, just to say um, hello to Adrian and to Anna who are our BSL interpreters and they'll be um, with us throughout today's session. We've also got the uh, Zoom's live transcription um, function switched on. So if you wish to use that, you'll be able to do that too. Um, I'm not sure how accurate it is, so please do send us any amusing um, attempts at transcription that the AI produces in the chat. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit first about the context of these talks, and then I will move on um, to the talks themselves. So we're part of a program called Bristol and Bath Creative R&D, and we've been going for just over two years now, um, just over halfway through a five-year programme. And the work that we do um, is focused on the creative economy and the creative industries in our area. So that's companies, businesses, practitioners working broadly in, in everything from the arts to computing to culture, through to filmmaking, technology, and all sorts of other things related to that. Um, we've been supporting various different um, practitioners to try and come up with new products and new ideas that might um, help their businesses grow and develop. But we've also done this in a particular, um, with particular focus on questions of inclusion, questions of social justice, and looking towards um, more sustainable and positive futures. We recognise that the way um, in which we, we have been doing things traditionally may not be the best way. And post-COVID, with calls for building back better, we've become particularly interested as a programme to try and investigate um, more about what that means and what that could look like. So that kind of interest has given rise to the Hopeful Futures seminar series. As I mentioned, this is the second one. We had our first one a couple of weeks ago, which is up now on Watershed's um, YouTube channel, should you wish to watch it. Um, which was about um, how we can use imagination and our imagination to collectively um, dream up different futures for ourselves. Today's session, um, Rethinking the Structures of the Present for a Different Future, is thinking more about, I guess, the next steps. So having imagined some different worlds, what might we want to consider about the way in which the world currently operates that we might want to think differently about and restructure and find new and alternative approaches to in order to um, affect the change. Next week, or sorry, before and next time, so the third seminar, we'll be talking about, um, I guess, the next step, which is speaking to individuals and organisations that are trying on the ground to kind of put some of these different ways of seeing into practice. Um, and you'll be able to see all of that um, on, the, um, on our website, which I think the link will go into the chat very soon to share with you. Um, if you've got any questions along the way for our panellists, please do put them in the chat or use the Q&A function. Um, and if you want to introduce yourselves in the chat, just so we know who's in our audience and so you can kind of meet other people in that space, please feel free to do so. So the format of today's talk is that I am going to introduce each of our wonderful panellists in turn. Um, I'm very excited about everybody you've got here today. Over the years I've seen them all speak and read their work and engage and have had the luck of working with some of them um, along the way as well, but to get them all under one roof is pretty exciting um, for me, so I want to thank them all for joining us. I'm not going to do a terrible attempt at embarrassing them by introducing them myself, so what I will do is I will go around and I will ask each of them to introduce themselves and talk for about five minutes or so about the work that they've been doing, the questions that they're interested in that relate to the talk. After that, I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be kind of um, uh, grilling them. I mean, asking them some uh, nice, easy uh, conversational questions um, about their work. And then towards the end of the session, we'll be also speaking, looking to the audience questions. So as those questions pop up, we'll come to them by the end. And we're hoping to wrap up by about half past three today. So if you have any questions for us, we have um, Susie and Julia also working behind the scenes, um, staffing the chat and making everything work. So please do feel free to, to, to pop up any questions or any kind of challenges there and they'll help um, to 
to um, respond to those. So without further ado, I'm sure I've forgotten something. If I have, I'm sure it'll come back again. Um, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, uh, Bill Sharp. Thanks, Simon. And hello, everybody. It's nice to be with you today. Um, yeah, I'm Bill Sharp. I'm a 70 year old white male, um, balding with a short grey beard, and I'm wearing my standard black fleece today. I hope that gives you an idea of who I am. Um, having been around for a bit, I'm not sure what the most important part of my background was, except that I spent the bulk of my career in the computer industry, which, as you will all know, transforms itself every 10 or 15 years. And that was a laboratory for me to learn the practice of futures and futures work. And now I spend all my time really helping people ask the questions that Simon was asking of how 10 billion people can all live well together on one planet and bringing various tools and processes um, into that. Um, and when Simon asked me to do this, I looked at this question that he was posing, which was how can we think differently? about the everyday structures of our lives. And I really wanted to focus not on answering the question about the structures, but talking about the thinking. And I see that as a journey of awareness. I think there's a widespread appreciation um, articulated by Einstein that if we use the same ways of thinking that created the problems, we'll just go on reproducing them. And that the most powerful point of change is to cultivate a better quality of awareness to bring to the situation in front of us. So I like to think of that as a step in our consciousness where we bring into our aware mind some way of being in the world that's already natural to us, but we maybe hadn't paid full attention to and that we can cultivate as we cultivate any other skill like learning a language or learning a sport or an instrument. And, and the name I give to this quality of awareness is future consciousness, an awareness of the future potential of the present moment. And I just want to make that seem really simple and obvious to you in, in one or two ways. So I thought I'd start by imagining playing a game on the beach. I think that's something all of us can relate to just now as something that we've really been missing and, and would like. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Now imagine that a few of you turn up on the beach. So here you are, you're just there, friends and family, a few of you just come together and maybe you've got a ball. And when you arrive there, you're gonna play a game, but where is the game? Where does the game come from? You wanna play a game to begin with, it doesn't exist. But then somebody says, oh, well, let's have a game of football. That's, that's the game of the moment. And as soon as you bring that to mind, then it becomes a pattern that connects. Gregory Bateson, the great system thinker talk, talked about the pattern which connects. So the pattern which connects becomes our shared reality. It's in each of our minds, and because we all have some idea of what the game of football is, it creates a pattern that we all share. And that pattern gives meaning and configures our actions in the moment. So it, it, it gives a shape and a meaning to each action. We put a couple of t-shirts or something down to make the goals. We kick the ball around and it configures and gives meaning to our actions. Was that a goal? Whose side are you on? So it gives meaning to the moment. So the pattern connects, but it's the lives that are going on here that really are the pattern. So these are the lives that embody at each moment. They are the pattern. There's no difference between the pattern and the actions. So the patterns produce, the actions produce the pattern. Now you'll often hear people talking about systems thinking and it sounds big and complicated, but I found that this is a really simple way that I find useful and people can connect with for opening up that awareness of the present moment so that we see everything we're doing as part of a pattern. So the first step into the consciousness that we need is to open up this sort of three dimensional view of the world, like opening both our eyes and seeing depth, being aware not only of our participation from moment to moment in a particular pattern, but of the pattern at the top that connects. So pattern and participation and opening up our awareness and seeing that everything in the universe is always in motion. And we're either reproducing an old pattern or we're using our freedom 
to step out of it and perhaps start a new one, like stepping out of that game and inviting people to play a new one. So all patterns are being maintained by our participation in them. And sometimes we have to step out of ones that are oppressive or broken or not good enough, not fit to the future and step over here and, and be willing to invite others to come and join the new game. That's the role of the, the visionary. So structures and flows, always in motion. Now, with this simple notion of, of pattern, we can develop it in a couple of dimensions. And the first one is what I call mutuality or the mutual qualities of life. And I realized that we don't in our English language have a very good word for this, which is why I've had to pick this, this one word or phrase of mutuality. For those qualities of life that you can really only have because you have them in common, like having a language. A human language has to be shared or it isn't really a human language. It would be something private to me justice, democracy, harmony, music. Each of them is immeasurably deeper. If it, if it has any meaning at all for an individual, it has immeasurably more meaning when it's seen as a shared quality of life. And because it's a shared quality of life, it means it's never static. Everyone, every baby is born into a language and then makes a unique contribution to carrying it forward. And if it were fixed, it would be exclusionary. It would be oppressive as some languages and, and things become. So once we become aware of the mutual qualities of playing the game, of having fun or competing or whatever sort of game it was, of music, of being in harmony with, with others, we become aware of the essential quality of that pattern that includes others, enabling them to be both fully themselves and fully part of the pattern. So I find that you can always ask people to connect with some area of their life where they feel simultaneously most fully part of themselves when they're most fully part of the whole. It might be being in a choir, being in a relationship, being in a game. And then I invite them to bring that quality of being in flow together with others into the center of their matter of concern. And often they find that a deeply painful experience because they realize how far away we are in our everyday patterns of life from ha having that quality of being in the human flow together. If we bring that into the issue of concern, it will give us a good guide to where we need to go. So we have this idea of progressive mutualism. Are we really engaging everybody being most fully and uniquely themselves in the patterns of life that we're preserving, we're maintaining? The other dimension speaks to sustainability or rather as I'd like to call it to regeneration. Um, I live on a hillside here in, in Wales and so there's a, a farm just below the house and the farmer and his family maintain the farm and this I did, that's their pattern they're sheep farmers so it's a, it's a sheep farm in the fields below the house but that's also above the house it is the common land and the common land there are many other farmers who also are participating in this and they manage it as a commons. And sustainability has become this somewhat weakened notion of can we just go on doing what we're doing without doing too much harm? Whereas the idea of regeneration is that each pattern supports the others. So in the way that they manage the commons, which is a site of special scientific interest, it both supports the sheep in their annual grazing, but then the commons is supporting the farm. So you can ask a question, and is my pattern, this organization, this life regenerative with respect to the other patterns? Is this ecosystem supporting the other ecosystems? Because all systems are nested. Every hole is part of some other hole. So we can ask the question, am I regenerative with respect to this pattern? And is this pattern regenerative with respect to the whole bioregion that we're part of? And so on up to, up to the planet. So while I've been here, when we first came here, the swallows used to come here from Africa. Now they no longer do. Somewhere this pattern of mutual support has been broken. The regenerative depth of this little farm, which used to have the swallows visiting, has been broken somewhere along that chain. We've lost one quality of regenerative depth. Now I've just been doing a piece of work with uh, Watershed on equitable futures um, and and what it would mean to cultivate watershed in its regenerative depth. So we convened a sort of microcosm of the system, people who had 
experiences of watershed's relationship with the wider um, community. And we explored this notion of both mutual qualities, when did people feel that they had been most part of the best they could be in relationship to watershed. But then we also explored the direction of travel as increasing this regenerative depth by saying what would the Bristol Commons most look like if all these different communities with watershed as just part of that all collectively maintained the health of the ecosystem, the cultural ecosystem, and that supported the depth of both every community with watershed as one of those participants. So this very simple pattern dimension lets us look at the strength and breadth of mutuality and depth of regeneration. And just to link it back to the title of Hopeful Futures, for me, the, the, the essence of hope is this sense that at any moment we can do something to renew the patterns of life. And that for me is the, is the essence of the virtue of hope, that however difficult the situation is, we have some power in ourselves to be this this source of, of hope that can be regenerative. We can do something which allows a new quality of mutual life to flourish. So thank you very much. That's, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Bill. I'm now going to hand over to Indy to introduce his work and talk about um, stuff, which I believe will chime quite nicely with, with Bill's work as well. Thank you. Um, I'm a I'm a 45 year old uh, brown skinned turban wearing um, Sikh um, sitting in uh, sitting in the garden speaking. Uh, I'm from Dark Matter Labs. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to be quick and precise and to make sure we have space for debate. And I suppose I want to sort of. I think we're under much more fundamental change. I, I don't think this is just a step. It's an evolution. I think we're in a much more fundamental change in our, our relationship with the world. And our relationship with the world has been conceptually and structured through a Newtonian enlightenment model around objects and things and objecthood as an idea. And I think we're in a moment where objecthood and seeing things in isolation no longer works. And it worked fantastically. Now, that's also, we should just be respectful. It was a great conceptual structure, but it no longer works because actually our interdependencies are manifesting and our feedback systems are killing us. Uh, and our feedback systems, I exist at the carbon level. Carbon is one feedback system, which, is, which we failed to consider, which is now self-terminating us as a civilization. And I think it is a symptom of a failure. It is not the failure itself. And this is one of the, people keep talking about carbon as the failure. It's not the failure. Carbon is a, is a symptom of us not being able to conceive of ourselves through an interdependent landscape. And, and I think that conception failure starts at the point of us as individuals and the word individuals. The conceptual theory of me as an individual, my rights as an individual, the kind of conception of consumerism, citizenship, this is all about individuality and the extension of individuality at the detriment of understanding our interdependence. And you can go back to stuff like, um, what's it called, when, uh, what did Michael Young write the book on in, in sort of, um, uh, where you have, you know, a meritocracy. Meritocracy as a thesis is an extension of the individuality at complete disrespect of our interdependence. And I think this failure, and I think since, since the 1970s, science has been way ahead of this theory. And, and I would say philosophy and science were way ahead of this. And our public policy is still captured in a landscape of industrial objecthood. So, when we talk about systems, actually the problem is not the tree. The tree is part of a system. Um, the tree um, lives and offers multiple benefits, creates whole ecosystems of value, yet our institutional human landscape around it perceives the tree as a liability. It is a liability on the books of, 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 of cities which chop it down after 10 years. And it perceives the tree through the abstraction 
of value in the true currency through the value of timber. Okay. So what we've got, what we've, are, and that is our conceptual landscape and that the kind of social imaginaries, which have constructed a landscape of objecthood and single utility value. And that manifests throughout everything we see, our employment laws, our extensions of servitude. You know, your employment law basically tells you you, can't, you don't have freedom of speech. And we live most of our time in an extension of servitude, not in an extension of actually emancipation, freedom and uh, development in that thesis. Our governance theories, our management theories are extensions of control because they're part of the same lineage of thinking. They've come from the idea of military. Most management theory came from military mechanisms, which came from kingships and other structures. And they are part of a control thesis on the world, largely around linear production, as opposed to recognizing us as interdependent systems in a completely different way. We perceive humans as independent of nature, not recognizing at best we are a, a waveform of nature itself. We are part of the consciousness of the planet. The human system and the machine system is building a new class of consciousness at a planetary scale, which challenges our individual consciousness. So I want to set the scene that I think this is a this is a fundamental failure in our in in our the way we see the world and where we've structured the institutions of the world. And now the challenge becomes that our institutions have locked us in through capital structures, through uh, ideas of land ownership, ownership, uh, can you own soil? Can you, can you actually own soil? Which is a kind of a, which needs to be a social good existing in a common, not only for present generations, but future generations. Our misunderstanding of risk only being understood to risk to the generate to us, as opposed to the risk we are currently generating for future generations, which is completely unpriced. So our social institutional imaginaries are fundamentally broken. And the case I make and is that actually our institutional infrastructure has locked us in into ways of seeing and ways of organizing and the ways of perpetuating value, which is now self-terminating us. That's it. The hopeful side, it can all be changed because they are social imaginaries. But we have to be bold and we have to be much bolder. And I think that's the other thing. I, and my biggest worry right now is the lack of imagination in our conversations. And I find it, my biggest worry right now is we, you know, we came out of World War II and we built the NHS. There was an imagination capacity of what was possible. And to kind of, can we rewrite the constitution? Of course we can. America wrote a constitution, some, what is it? I think 12, 13 men came together and wrote a constitution for our country. Why can't we rewrite things? And I think this is a, a, a kind of, we have diminished ourselves and our ability for audacity and our ability for large scale changes. Why can't we actually change part? What makes it so sacrosanct? Why can't we shift from, from voting to sortation? Nothing. And I think we have been trapped by our own languages and theses as a, and, and actually lack boldness. Great, thank you very much, Indy. That's a, a fantastic exhortation to kind of think about some of those things that I guess that calcify us. And I can see the parallels between some of Bill's thinking uh, uh, and about that kind of the evisceration of imagination and the way in which the, the possibility for otherwise becomes, um, I guess, yeah, calcified as 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 the reality which has no has no alternative. So I'm now going to hand over to. Um, Liz Idler to hear from her about her amazing work as well. Thanks, Simon. Uh, slightly follow that. I mean, I've, I've felt like cheering all the way through the last two um, speakers. And what I'd really like to do is to have a really fantastic roll our sleeves up philosophical debate. But I will tell you a little bit more about the work of the organization that um, uh, I helped set up uh, about 12 years ago. So my name is Liz Zeidler. Um, I am, what do you, I'm in classic. I'm a middle-aged white woman. I've got dark, but very graying short hair. And I'm wearing a slightly over the top for Zoom kind of 
fluffy thing with orange and various leaves on it. Um, uh, and I um, helped set up an organisation called the Centre for Thriving Places um, about 10, 12 years ago. Um, and we're part of, I think, what's in increasingly being called, but I mean, I never really like umbrella names, but the kind of movement for a well-being economy. So our ambition, if you like, in, in, in big picture terms, and we're definitely talking big picture today, is to really radically, in that way that Indy's just been talking about, rethink what the whole economy is for and redesign the, the rules, as Bill was describing, of the game of economy um, uh, to really start taking into account you know, all of the sorts of ideas, actually, um, that we've just been talking about and, and thinking about what the whole purpose of the economy is. And I quite like a quote from somebody called Kate Rayworth, who many of you might know, who wrote a book about donut economics. And she said that we have an economy that seeks to grow whether or not we thrive. And we need an economy where we thrive whether or not it grows. And it's a very simple sentence, but actually there's a profound question at the heart of it. And I think for me, it really talks to the, to the idea of what's the end goal? What's the point of it all? <laughs> what's the point of the economy? What's the point of all of our busyness collectively or individually? What's the point of business, education, health? What the hell is it all for? Um, and at the moment, we've got this extraordinary assumption that's embedded into those rules. I loved Bill's drawing into the rules of the economy that let's not forget, we made those rules. We as humans designed this economy. We shape it every single day with all of our activities and our choices. And we absolutely have the power and the right to completely rip up those rules and start again. And there is a, the assumption that's right at the heart of that economy is that the end goal is the growth of that economy. It's a ridiculous self-fulfilling prof prophecy. And we define you know, success and prosperity and, and growth and, and all of those things by whether or not that economy is growing. And, and we define that in very narrow terms around measures like GDP growth, which is ultimately, putting it really simply, it's are we grow producing and consuming more stuff this year than we did last year? And are we going to produce and consume more stuff next year than we did this year? Which if you stop for a moment and think of it, it's like the emperor's new clothes. It's the most bonkers idea that that somehow is success. That's progress. That's what we're all aiming to do. And instead of just, just being, it, a lot of this stuff was designed after the, after the Second World War, but when perhaps the idea of growing the economy was particularly important. But at this point in our in our um, evolution, the idea that that is where we're all heading, and therefore we are designing all the parts of the system to deliver that. You know, healthcare becomes about saving money, and and education is about um, you know um, in enabling young people to be job ready, whatever the hell that means, and not about life ready. And you know, culture and the arts and and those sorts of things are the first things to be cut because they're not seen as adding to that growth of consumption. And of course, inevitably, as Indy was just describing. This is a, you know, it's designed to create those, these, the things we're seeing are not, are not symptom, accidental symptoms of a system, climate change, spiraling inequality, those kinds of things are not accidental outcomes, they are fundamentally built into the model that we have designed of this economy. So what the sort of movement towards really challenging that, that we're a small part of is trying to do is say, let's really challenge that basic assumption. Let's start saying that the end goal of our activity, of our economy, of our, of our busyness, of the rules of the game, if you like, as Bill put it, um, let's, let's start saying that that, that end goal is about our increasing our capacity to thrive now and for future generations. So our, our, our own individual well-being, but very importantly, our, our collective well-being and our planetary and societal well-being, if you like, in its broadest, broadest sense. And once you make that the end goal, then all of the decisions, whether they're about how we design our cities, whether they're about what, you know, what we invest our money, our time, our love, our passion, our thinking in, become about whether or not they're supporting us all to thrive equitably and sustainably now and into the future. And, and a lot of the work that, that we do at the Centre for Thriving Places 
is start trying to make that really practical to net today. Because actually, if you go out and talk to people in communities or you talk to people at the sharp end of, of, of helping us to deliver the services that we have or support people at the margins of our society, they have not got time to redesign the economy. And so what we try and do is make it really practical to start that process right now, here today. So we've got new measures of progress. We've got something called the Thriving Places Index that we publish for every place in the UK every year, regardless of whether or not we've been asked to do it by anyone. We basically ask that fundamental question. Let's put some different metrics at the heart of our decision making that say, are we creating the right conditions for, to, for people to thrive? Are we doing that equitably so far more people can thrive? And are we doing that sustainably so future generations have got the opportunity to thrive as well? And when local governments, local communities, local businesses, health departments, whatever, start putting that kind of metric at the heart of their thinking, at their, you know, the, how, how they commission things. How, of course, it doesn't immediately shift the whole economy. We're talking about a tanker here, but we're trying to support places to take that initiative as collective as collective spaces so they don't have to wait for an enlightened government like they're starting to have in one or two places around the world. We're seeing this sort of well-being economics movement happening in small pockets around the world, but we don't have to wait for Boris Johnson to wake up tomorrow and have a moment of, of, of insight. Let's not wait for that, if I'm honest. Um, uh, and, let's, and let's start doing this in our communities, in our cities, in our local governments today, and putting these kind of much more fundamental questions that create that regenerative nature. Because when you start asking those sorts of questions, you know, do I build a huge out of town, um, you know, a center for either arts or for shopping? Um, or do I um, support something much, much more locally with local businesses? The decision making becomes much, much clearer because the the benefits to the existing economy of an out of town place where you're driving to it, you're making, you know, somebody from, you know, Taiwan is investing in it, et cetera, et cetera. They're all very clear when you're looking at GDP as your end goal. But when you start looking at the well being of people and planet as your end goal, a much more localized version of that, a much more held in the commons space of that, a much more redesign the rules around which this game is, is, is created becomes the obvious answer. So I think my message today is. You know, turning the economy upside down, which is what we need to do, and completely redesigning it is a very, very long term task that we should all be part of and completely agree with the previous speakers. But we can start with that where we are today and build momentum for that wider, wider movement as we go. Let's not just sit here and wait for that moment to come. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> that exhortation to kind of do stuff, I think, is something that, 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 that we are feeling. And, um, and it kind of reminds me of the way that, that some of this work came about was actually a few years ago. We were, we were attending um, an event at what was Impact Hub Birmingham, um, who were closing down and re recreating each other's Civic Square. And it's where I saw Indy speak and I saw um, Kate Rayworth speak, who, who, who Liz mentioned as well. And, um, and a number of other people. And there was this moment where it's like, there are a lot of us thinking about these different things in different ways, but we're not always in the same room. And so what's been really amazing about particularly um, this kind of space in this moment is that ability to start bringing together these threads and these conversations into a space where, where, where certainly I've not seen it happen in quite the same way in the creative sector and the creative economy in the way that, that, that perhaps it could and should happen. So, so there's that thing about bringing people together for action to imagine and see what we can do is, is kind of definitely wonderful. So I am now going to hand over um, to Sam. There we go. <laughs> um, and um, then after that, we'll move on to some questions. But for now, Sam, over to you. Thank you. And I think you can really start to see where there is a lot of overlap and convergence amongst amongst all of us. Uh, I am Sam. I'm a middle aged white female with red hair that is up uh, and I'm currently wearing what I hope is a rather adorable top with uh, decorative elephants on it. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, I think, the infrastructure of, in, of tech innovation that happens today, um, drawing on and building on quite a lot of the things that all of the previous speakers have talked about in terms of systems, uh, systems change and, and reimagining all of these structures that our world is currently built in. Um, and I think I, I'm not alone in what we're alluding to. I know this is about hopeful futures, but the reality is that, you know, right now we really are in a number of converging crises. It feels like the world is a bit of a mess. 
Um, you know, and there's a lot of global challenges that we're facing from climate change to economic crises to poverty, um, inequality, and, and many other things. And I think one of the root causes of so many of these crises is the reality that people are disempowered and they don't have enough opportunities to directly feed into the forces that are shaping their lives. So policy, capital, and innovation are happening in concentrated areas and ecosystems that the vast majority of people don't have access to, let alone power over. Um, and technology innovation underpins nearly every one of these systems and structures that we have in, in place at the moment. It accelerates so much of our, our human messiness um, and kind of intermediates our relationship with, with nature and, and the planet. Um, and so much of how businesses and tech products are made are based on these blueprints that have very specific worldviews baked into them, um, worldviews which have gotten us to so many of these crises. And as long as these tech and businesses are using these self-perpetuating templates, as, as Bill mentioned, um, there's just going, and there continues to be this incredible divide and disconnect between public services and spaces people access every day and that policy capital and innovation that creates the structures in which we live um, we're only ever going to be making changes in the margins uh, so as everyone was speaking to we really do need to step back and, and be quite bold and audacious as india was saying about reimagining what exactly these structures look like and how we can start to connect uh, the innovation and these technology and business templates with creating uh, value in thri thriving communities. So in my business is consequential, we do a little bit of what we call big I and little I innovation to change the existing uh, business and tech ecosystem. And so big I is a focus on that large scale systems change, um, looking at more responsible ways of creating and running uh, uh, technology systems and businesses that can have a positive impact on people and planet. Uh, and some of that is really thinking about, you know, what is the actual intent and purpose of, of these innovations, of these businesses, of these tech products, of these things that are getting put into the world, and who gets to be involved in that innovation process? Uh, and what does it look like to start from a place of foresight and start from a place of imagining the impact and the consequences of those technology products and systems on not only the end user, but you know, a wide variety of stakeholders, as Liz and Indian Bill all mentioned, um, communities, ecosystems, future generations, the planet itself. Uh, and the guiding light we really we really use is to critically challenge that norm. What is disruption uh, for the common good? So, you know, there are things in the world that deserve to be shaken up and they deserve to be challenged uh, and they deserve to do that on the behalf of the most good for the most people. And instead, what we have is the system where we value disruption for the sake of disruption or a disruption for the sake of growth, uh, as Liz as Liz was alluding to our visions of what success is uh, in, this, in this technology and business ecosystem at the moment is at the expense of actually ensuring that all of us are able to have meaningful, thriving lives and opportunities to, to shape and have power over what, what those look like. Um, and, you know, more practically, some of the things that this big eye innovation might look like is um, we have a project underway to start to connect innovation and capital of the tech sector with public and community libraries across the UK, using their spaces as test beds for tech products and tech policy, um, leveraging their trusted relationships with the community to help people take advantage uh, of the opportunities that being a leading data nation may, may offer as, as Boris envisions. Um, but more broadly, the question is really, how can we start to um, be brave and bold enough to experiment with new ways of being successful and showing other people how innovating uh, differently can be better? Um, and then the little I innovation is really more about our focus on interwoven strategy, governance, culture, and change within individual organizations. Uh, and in this, we are ruthlessly pragmatic, which is, I think, a lens I'll bring to the rest of this, this talk as well. Um, 
you know, the best parts of innovation often happen in the seemingly boring parts of, of a business and in the seemingly boring parts of a society. Uh, and so that's why we focus on things like governance, designing principles, policies, and practices that help to govern everyday decisions in line with the values and the types of visions of what a, a positive, hopeful future may look like for everyone. Um, what can that start to look like on the ground in the, in the day to day as we innovate? Thank you very much. Um, well, I've been writing a lot of notes, and I'm 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 already overwhelmed <laughs> by, by by the scope, the synergies, and the possibilities for kind of discussion and and and, and uh, I guess disruptions between some of the ideas that we, we've seen kind of spoken about as well. And I think just to kind of quickly reiterate that that point about how the creative economy and the creative industries um, has kind of become quite embedded in, in what we've seen today. Um, is the, the policy that underpinned the space that we, the we as Bristol Bath Creative r and now live in, where the money comes from to kind of talk about creativity and the creative and all of this kind of stuff. A very big part of that political movement started with New Labour um, and their invention of creative industries. And actually we've got another, there's another talk that has been um, recorded for the Digital Cultures Research Centre um, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, by Jonathan Gross, and he was talking very much about how when they were coming up with the idea of the creative industries, um, the basically the way that they made it float in government was to connect it explicitly to GDP and explicitly to growth. And so you can see, um, and also how the model of things like Silicon Valley was kind of really baked into this reworking of the cultural sector. So there are all these kind of kind of political moments that you can you can map and see, um, and that talk does a really great job of kind of connecting them. If you're kind of interested about how that kind of stuff happens, and I think all of our speakers have kind of shown the different scales for which for which that thing is um, embedded and how complex it is to try and move through. Um, I'm going to ask if any of our speakers have any questions for each other at this moment in time. If there's anything that's uh, questions, clarifications, challenges, prompts, anything like that that's sprung to mind um, before I get stuck in. I, think I just saw Bill, Bill's hand there. Bill. Yeah. Um, having come from the technology world and the big systems world, I'm very conscious of the way that technology spreads, whether it was the invention of paper and writing or printing press or now we're all on Zoom. Um, you think how fast Zoom spread in the pandemic and we're all pretty grateful for it. And we're also all in complete agreement that unless we change something fundamental in our awareness and assumptions about the world, we can't get out of this fix. But that's a long, hard, messy process. And I hear in this field, some set of people saying, we, we change systems, we get going, we analyze the problem and we fix it over here. And I hear other people, um, like many of us here, saying it's a long, difficult process to bring about the change in people's philosophies and attitudes, and we don't seem to know how to scale that up to meet the needs. So I'm very interested in what my co-speakers think about that capacity to bring about a rapid change in our more deep-seated assumptions that we surely need. Thank you. Does anybody want to respond first? I'm happy to play. Um, I, I think we're living in science fiction right now. I've been locked down for 16 months. Who would have imagined this would have been our reality? I could not have even, even imagined it. I, I think we underestimate our capacity for radical change. Actually, I would go the other way. And if COVID, if nothing has proved that more, it's COVID. Uh, in, in a sense, that how much I used to be traveling pretty much every every week I would be traveling twice uh, in some fashion or another twice a week I'd be traveling I'd almost certainly and I have not traveled for 16 months and I'm now refusing travel <laughs> like, you know I'm not going to do a, so I'm not going to travel for one hour meeting I'm just not going to do it right um, I think we're seeing and that just that one thing will shift cities cities are not going to look like they've looked and that's not a bad thing you know <laughs> I think they're going to be transformed so I I don't know I I'm very hopeful um I think large change is possible I think it's not in the interests of large change which is why everyone's saying oh go back to the office why there's a completely dead unproductive control-oriented space 
And actually, there was a whole leaching economy around it, which had low, low, low value. You can't say buying sandwiches was somehow the future of the British economy. So I don't, I, yeah, I think, I think that disrupt destruction is okay. I think that that's where we're at. And we're in the middle of pretty radical economic geography. So I don't know, I'm, I stand in a place of, I think, extraordinary hope. I think, yeah, I'll stop. Um, I might leap in, Simon. Um, I completely... Is that right? If I leap? Frozen. Yes, this could be, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I really, really agree with Indy. Sorry, something froze there, didn't it? Um, I really, really agree with Indy uh, in the sense of I have a huge amount of hope, and I think COVID's a ludicrously good example uh, across the board in so many levels. I mean, there are a couple of great examples there from Indy. You know, we're also seeing it in, in the speed with which communities have been able to step into some of those spaces that we need them to step into, and you know, the ways that power has been transferred because it, they did people didn't have any choice, so they have transferred powers in spaces, etc. So I think I really agree with that. Uh, all of those principles I mentioned earlier, the Empress you close. It might just be that I'm quite old, and so other people aren't aware of all those kind of children's fairy tales. But the, you know, the idea of the Empress you close was there was a small boy in a crowd who pointed out that this, you know, cocky flipping emperor was actually naked and didn't have any new clothes when he was claiming to have them. And I think we, there's there's a really strong need for a kind of collective activity in calling out those really fundamental assumptions that are holding up the current incredibly destructive paradigms, the stories we have been told for so long that now we, we don't even question them. They're so interwoven through every part of our system. So starting to see those assumptions and, and really getting together as a, as a huge complex global network of organizations trying to deal with the symptoms of a lot of these um, fundamental systems problems, actually one of the things we need to do collectively is start calling out those those ludicrous assumptions because my experience is if when you can talk you know i've done this sort of work and talking about these sorts of ideas everywhere from you know big boardrooms to prisons and community centers and churches and schools and actually when you start talking to people people get it it's so not rocket science people do understand it they they do understand what what else is possible they do have a very shared across cultural and economic and social divides a very shared idea of what a, a very different future could look like so i have a huge optimism both in our capacity for big system changes as indy described but also in the power if we can do it and collectivizing our kind of calling out of one or two of the fundamental principles that if we pull them out like Jenga sticks, you know, it can really, really fundamentally shift those rules of the game that we would, that Bill was talking about at the beginning. Um, I'll, I'll jump in a little bit too in that I think something, is, that, Bill, your question is something I think about a lot. Um, and it's often that big, visible, radical, loud change that gets so much attention and that people can very easily point to. Um, but I think a lot of real change is actually quite quiet uh, and it's just the little building blocks that get put in place over time that eventually lead towards or build towards uh, a, loud, a loud and radical change and you know some of the work that we're doing here simply by talking about these ideas may spark new thinking in someone else in the audience in a few, a few years from now another crisis will take place and they'll be able to step in um, with that idea. And, and so I don't want to devalue uh, some of the work of quiet, quiet change that takes place and helps to create the conditions for uh, loud and radical change. I, I, I had a question for the group um, about growth. Um, so, so growth is a really challenging conversation because I think it's, it's rhetorically, you know, there's loads of conversation about going, going saying degrowth, uh, degrowth is fine, we need to degrow. The reality is we need to get the top 20% of the population to degrow, right? right. Let's be precise. Um, second is actually degrowth as a whole economy when we'll degrow, the politics of degrowth is usually warfare if we look back in history, right? Because when you make the, 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 
the cake smaller, uh, what you fight is the fight then becomes who has that portion of cake. In a growing economy, you can always go, okay, we'll split the growth differently. So the kind of the thesis of growth, which is kind of very, and then the other part is which aspect our material economy needs to become circular and reduced. Our biomaterial, bio, the biointegrity base needs to be regenerated and grow. Our intangibles economy needs to be growing radically. An intangible economy includes care. So I, 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 want, I suppose my intuition is that we just need to be, I, I, I'd like to be careful about the word growth now and actually use it in all its different nuances rather than singular words, because I think they, they hide a lot of injustices in them and nuances. And I wonder how we, how we have that conversation as well in a, in a more nuanced way, because I think in the nuance, there's huge possibility. Bill. Yeah, I think I've tried to redefine for myself the economics, the, 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 the neoclassical economics that tells the story that it's about the allocation of um, scarce resources to competing ends. Whereas I think if you look at the economy of life, it's the configuration of mutual abundance, which is the definition I use. And if you look at the history of the earth, you can see that that flow of energy from the sun beating down on a bare earth of rock and water produce the abundance of life that surround us. And I look out on a huge, beautiful pair of uh, sycamore trees outside the window in the field below. And every year the tree throws away all its leaves. It's extraordinarily wasteful. The flow of material resources is what serves the world. And in that sense, we have seen the growth of the world of the world over eons is a growth of abundance and a growth of complexity and a growth of material circulation, health and wealth. And I think if we if we looked at the real numbers, as I think one of you was saying, we, you published the numbers on thriving. If we looked at the last 200 years, we would see that we have been in degrowth. We need to invert the argument. The last 200 years have been an experiment in degrowth, living off the capital of the planet and destroying the intrinsic wealth of the patterns of the biosphere. I've got a book on the shelf, it's called Planetary Economics. And I read all the way through it and found it had not a single sentence about the economy, economics of the planet. It was all about global economics. Whereas what we have done is we have been in a period of degrowth in the human biosphere economy and abundance is the natural property of life. Mutual abundance is what a rainforest does destroy it and you collapse to a lower level. So I'm even more hopeful in that sense that our material economy can be reinvented, not only as sort of separate from the biosphere, but as an intrinsic recirculation of bio, biomaterials. So the biomaterial economy will allow us to thrive again and reproduce that quality of abundance. But of course, it's a tricky argument to take because we can easily end up sounding like we're just going to go on with the same old GDP growth. But I think if we recast the current GDP growth as essentially the degrowth of the planet and restore human economy and natural economy as mutually regenerative, then we have Kate Rayworth's notion that the thriving now is, is in the foreground and the growth in terms of net circulation is is what serves that so so i think the really radical future is available is one of abundance yeah and absolutely I, sorry simon no, let's go for it. I want to go around everybody's time and i just want to say i think i was one who brought up the sort of growth thing in the in the introductory bits and i completely agree with what the two uh, previous uh, people have said i i think it's i think it's really really important that the fundamental question is what do we want and need to grow and that won't always be the same across time or across continents or across communities what we need to grow um is 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 a deeply important question and what we don't need to grow and what we need to shrink is a deeply important question and it's a question that i think there's a lot of wisdom in in communities about um but i think one of the the, the challenges has been this obsession with one very very specific and very narrow materialistic idea of growth and the fact that perpetual growth in anything 
is a possibility. You know, the nature, your tree, you know, it drops its leaves. It's, you know, things die, things regenerate, things move, you know, growth is part of a cycle. It's never just a, a an exponential line um, uh, that goes on forever. So I think we just need to really fundamentally question what it is we're growing, why we're growing it, where we're growing it, how we're growing it, uh, rather than, you know, I'm not remotely anti-growth. I'm just anti very, very narrow, destructive idea that that is the end goal to, to, to keep on growing a particular form of ec economic wealth in a very few hands. <laughs> yeah, um, I think one of the really, one of the things that I've been thinking about, and, and I wonder how you feel about it. So in, in a moment, I'd like to come and move on to think a little bit about some of that ruthless pragmatism and thinking about hearing a little bit more from the panel about how, how it is that these multiple questions and, um, and I guess kind of what feels like cognitive acrobatics, although it's actually very simple, it is actually a kind of an inversion of a lot of what we have come to understand as norms. So I would like to move on to that in a moment. But before we get there, I was just thinking about the challenge of, I guess, time and temporality in this, not so much in the time that we have to make the change, but also in the way in which there are, um, we're talking about both designing with the future in mind so there's a kind of a sense of future generations the next thing thinking about our impacts but also kind of thinking about um uh i guess legacies and how we might um how we might kind of move encounter some of those legacies of the past as well as moving into the present so the one thing that was when i was trying to understand or put together a kind of a way of understanding and um, what Indy was saying about the kind of the materiality and the objecthood and the kind of ways in which these things happen. And I was thinking about the M32 motorway, which for those of you who in Brist know it, in, in Bristol, for example, it runs from the outside, from the M4 through into the centre of town. And to put it in place in the 1950s, 60s, they basically cut through a big community. They destroyed the community to kind of place this object, um, which is just around the corner from my house, as a big flyover. Um, and it remains there as a kind of a testament to kind of to to a version of the future that was actually only a temporary. So actually, that flyover was only expected to have a life span of about, I think, 50 years, something like that anyway. Um, and actually, what we've discovered is that we've not done anything with it. So we've left it. So that flyover still um, exists. It was never designed to last as long as it ha ha as long as it has, because the idea was that we would have come up with an alternative by now that would have fixed that issue. We wouldn't need to have a flyover that lasted for 100 years, 200 years, because we were going to do something about it, and we haven't. So, and the legacy remains um, of the um, of the divided community, all of these um, kinds of questions. So, I was just kind of wondering a little bit how we how we juggle both legacies and and the challenge of designing for a future that hasn't arrived yet, when at some point it will arrive. Um, so that's a bit of an incoherent question, but I was just wondering if anybody had any kind of responses to that about kind of time, future planning, um, and attending to the past and the future. I've stumped everybody with an over complex analogy. I do apologize. <laughs> um. uh, I think I can take a bit of a, a bit of a stab at that, Simon. Um, I think something I find specifically in the tech sector is this deep seated belief that everything they're doing is brand new um, and deeply unique and important when in fact so many of the problems they're encountering and the structures they're using um, come from other places or have existed before uh, and the problems that they're facing are well known in other disciplines. and. I think there's something in the value of knowing history and being able to draw on examples from the past and take the best parts of, of what has been fixed before um, and starting to apply that, apply that to now or to draw on other disciplines uh, or draw on other sectors or other ways of doing things and starting to, to stitch together a slightly more comprehensive picture of how all these different spaces of innovation and all these different parts of, of our world and our systems work. Um, and so maybe a bit more tangibly, 
something something that suddenly has come back in vogue a little bit is this idea of guilds. Um, and so guilds used to exist uh, in England back in, I think, the 16, 1700s or so. Um, you know, you had the grocer's guild who got to decide who owned a, who owned a grocery store uh, in a city. And the idea of guilds is suddenly a really interesting idea again in marketing agencies. Um, is there some kind of central central place or body that can define what good marketing standards are and, and who might be able to have a stamp of approval on practicing that? Uh, and so I think to your point, there, there's there's a there's a middle ground between knowing history and drawing on the past and using that to reimagine the better parts of the of the future. Um, I think other people can probably build on this slightly more elegantly now that I've taken a stab at your initial <laughs> initial position. Thank you. I think that was very elegant given the inelegance of my own my own question there. Um, does anybody want to jump in there? Liz. Um, I think I, I, I slightly there's a risk of me slightly repeating because I think I have a huge amount of faith in a, a sort of a well of of wisdom within us. Um, that we perhaps don't always tap into. So sometimes it's about asking really powerful questions. And a lot of the work that we did in the early stages of trying to develop some different ways of thinking about a different kind of economy were about asking people in all sorts of different communities in different parts of the world, et cetera, about what really, really matters to them. And, you know, some really fundamental questions. And one of the things I find quite, quite heartening is if you ask people, you know, if you ask people a lot about what that, you know, what brings them happiness or well-being, whatever else, they often stay at quite a superficial level. But if you ask people what they want for their children, for instance, or if they haven't got children for their, you know, nieces and nephews or whatever it is, people answer really profoundly, <laughs> right across the board. People want for their children, you know, a sense of belonging, a connection to others, health. They want them to find purpose and meaning in their lives and you know they want some really profoundly important things um and, and they're not necessarily as influenced by the kind of materialism that we're told about day in day out so i think when we're looking at designing for the future we need to kind of almost go back to basics and think about what are, what are the fundamental building blocks for humans to live in balance with with nature in a way that supports you know, as all to thrive. I mean, hence the kind of fundamental question at heart of the organisation that I work with. Um, you know, so I think if we if we use those kind of really fundamental questions, they don't change so much with different, you know, political landscapes and economic landscapes, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we're designing in, if you like, a longevity because, you know, was the fundamental thing that required the M32 to be built based on really, really um, important core things that, that human beings need to, to thrive on a thriving planet? I mean, no, they it definitely wasn't. So I think it's a, it's a sort of slightly esoteric answer, but, you know, how do we really come back to basics and ask the fundamental questions each time we make a decision, whether that's a really small decision on a day-to-day -day basis about how we live our lives or a huge policy question about how we design our futures and how we legislate for, you know, a much more equitable and, and empowered world. Thank you for starting to make sense of what I was <laughs> going for. Um, Indy or Bill, would you like to respond to those? Yeah. I'm Indy? happy to go next. Yeah, I'm happy to go next. So uh, firstly, thank you uh, uh, thank you to Sam and Liz uh, for setting this up um, and buying, buying the time. So I appreciate that. Um, uh, so I want to start this conversation slightly differently, which is, we currently know we're heading for three and a half degrees temperature rise. Three and a half degrees, not one and a half degrees, three and a half degrees. So actually the problem is not necessarily the fact that we don't think, I think there is a problem of long-term thinking, but three and a half degrees is what we're heading towards. Our inability to actually cope with this future and to turn this future from being rather just a political football to actually being a technical response to three and a half degrees we do not have that institutional capability because actually the reality is that future is a political theory as opposed to being a technical risk that we're all living under which is really where we are the technical risk and it's a risk that has got large span differential impact for different sectors of the community but different differential impacts to global north global south so the one question is that what do we have the institutional capability 
as democracies to think about the future. And I think one of the big fundamental failures that we have is democracy has become about representation of my views as opposed to representation of public interest. And that means that both, both democracy and market have become fragile, febrile, micro response systems. And actually one of the biggest crises I think we face in the West is that we do not have the institutions to think for 50 years. And we don't know how to make legitimate thinking institutions for the next 50 years. And that is a structural crisis that we have. And, and so that's one aspect of it. Second aspect is that actually when we're starting to talk about the future, we, we, we are not, I think we are fundamentally currently terminating future generations. We're in the act of murder of future generations. We've already murdered billions of animals and species or millions of species. We're in the extinction of level events. We're in the process of doing that to, uh, to, to future generations. We do not have accountability in, in frameworks into the future. So I think it's, it's not a soft thing. I think it's a technical societal growing up thing. Um, and actually, you know, if I sort of say, you know, how do we start to think about the next thousand years? Right, a thousand year risks, 100 year risks, 50 year risks. We don't have the institutional wherewithal to it. And this is also this kind of, I would say this part of the problem is this individualism. We perceive ourselves as a perpetual sort of middle-aged person that will live and die. But actually we'll always be this kind of, we, but we are part of a genealogy of, of kind of science, chemistry and biology, which is kind of what, 13.8, five billion years old. Actually, we don't see ourselves as flows in time rather than objects and you know, the other dimension I wanted to put in is that what is becoming really interesting right now is the rise of what I would call planetary consciousnesses. So climate change may be the first event where there is a consciousness emerging at a planetary scale, which is able not only to perceive the climate change effects, but also be able to actually then return back into doing something about it. So we may be in an age where the planet is becoming conscious. And I like Bill's term of kind of planetary economics. We may be at an age where the idea of the individuality of human, we are now part of a planetary consciousness. And I think it's reconceiving ourselves into a new way becomes really critical. And we're locked into all sorts of other paradigms in that process. But I suppose I would just start to sort of like, how do you build society which is able to think in time and be in time? I think is a big structural question in space. And, and then the final point I'd make is that the reality is we know, like for example, we know so much that isn't, that isn't imported. So air pollution in our houses has massive impact on people's, people's lively, lives. Homes next to ro roads take 10 years of people's lives. We know in terms of epigenetics, actually poverty has, a, has, a, has an intergenerational effect. The science that talks about time and impact is there. No science problem. The fact is we can't construct the political theory to turn that science into actually what are societal norms. Microbiomes has an effect on our cognitive performance throughout our life. The way we construct our world is fundamentally problematized in that thesis. So I wonder whether this is a, you know, there's a kind of, there's a much deeper question for me about are we any more a science-led civilization? And by science, I don't mean truths. I mean, science is a mechanism to, unhold, to hold uncertainties. It's a societal mechanism to hold uncertainties. Science never gives you truth. It gives you best sort of plausible realities, which will always be disrupted later on. And I think we've, be, we've become, we're no longer able to create the engine for that. We, we live in a world of opinion. Thank you. Bill, do you have anything to add to that? I'm not sure there were so many interesting <laughs> points. I've rather <laughs> lost track of where we started. I think the, the main thing I was holding on to was Buckminster Fuller made a comment along the lines of don't try and attack the old, but in, invent the new that makes the old obsolete. And I think one of the other speakers had a nice phrase about essentially how do we collectivize this movement? we're not short of the knowledge we need we're actually not short of the understanding and goodwill amongst ordinary people that we need fundamental change it's widespread the challenge we're having is giving that 
that broad-based movement, Paul Hawking called it the movement without a name, because there are so many organizations and people who want this change, and yet we haven't managed to give it an equal or even greater power as that of the market and the current institutions that are driving us in the wrong direction. Um, so that's what I work on is how, and that's why I work on these simple ways of thinking. How do we have ways that allow everybody to come together and, and pool their purpose and their will um, so that we can be, as someone put it, hospice workers for the dying culture and midwives for the new. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. I'd like to now sort of start moving towards some of the questions that have been coming in from the audience. Um, and actually, I think they also take some quite nice flow to the kind of return, like I mentioned, to that kind of sense of the ruthless pragmatism. One of the points that was made earlier on um, in the chat was um, that as we try and be audacious to uh, in, in our thinking of redesigning of the systems, and this also speaks to what Andy was just saying about the kind of the failure of our current kind of system of, of governments and, democ and, and democracy is that at the same time, there's some very audacious people in power in various places in the world at the moment who are um, perhaps digging in, refusing to accept um, that society as in civilization is in that hospice space and actually that their actions are um, prohibitive. We see the shift to the right, we see the shift towards I think what Indy was describing is the fact-based society where actually it's not really fact but opinion that kind of drives these things and that kind of the opposition I guess to the things that we're talking about right here and right now. So one of the questions that we have related to that is um, is how we make these conversations part of the discourse of those in power to implement change, um, how we start to kind of make those over the micro or macro changes to kind of shift that um, and I was wondering if anybody had any just just for the audience examples of the work that they've done the people that they've worked with the ways in which they've engaged actors at different kinds of levels to kind of start doing that um, to start trying to convince people that actually um, there are other ways of doing things So examples of what have you been up to, I guess, is what I'm, I'm wondering. <laughs> Gosh. Shall I jump in? Um, uh, so I, I saw that question come up in the, in the comments, and I think one of the things they were asking for as well was the kind of examples, not just of our work, but of others. And I, I'm going to try and combine those two a little bit. This is a tricky one because in some senses it came in a quite a hierarchical traditional from a quite a hierarchical traditional place. But I think it's an interesting example. Many of you might have heard of uh, Bill, certainly, well, I think he's been cities in Wales, uh, the, the Future Generations um, Act that was passed in Wales. Now, we've had quite a lot of work working with local authorities trying to implement that, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I've mentioned it quite a few times in different times I've spoken around the world. And I think one of the reasons I mention it is because one of the things I'm most impressed by that, that piece of legislation, well, I'll tell you about the legislation in a minute, is that they basically, from what I gather from a lot of people involved at the time, they, they put this piece of legislation in before they'd really thought about the consequences. <laughs> and that doesn't sound like a very good idea, except for the fact that sometimes when you need to be bold and audacious, you can't wait till you've worked out everything that's going to happen from it. So the point about this legislation, and it's not at all perfect, so I'm not necessarily holding up, it up as an ideal, but the point of it is it puts into, into you know, the law in Wales is that, that uh, you know, all public, um, publicly funded public activity has to consider the well-being of current and future generations if it's going to get any public cash, basically. I mean, it's a bit more complicated than that. But it's basically saying you need to be thinking about the implications of this, this choice, this policy, this investment on the, on the well-being of current and future generations. They put this into place, and to be honest with you, it caused havoc in the public sector in Wales because everyone was like, well, we don't know how to do that and how do we measure it and, you know, how does it go with our current system, et cetera. The reason I mention it is because I think sometimes we need that kind of acting. We need to kind of go, this is required. It makes sense. It's morally and systems-wise the right thing to do. And we will deal with the fact that it then causes havoc later on. 
And I think we've then been able to follow up and support some of those people because, as you know, as Bill said, there's an incredible movement out there of all sorts of organizations around the world with lots of the solutions. You know, there are people doing amazing things in this space in Iceland and New Zealand and Costa Rica and California and France. And, you know, people are doing extraordinary things. And organizations like ours and many others are trying to bring a lot of that understanding together and then make it practical. I absolutely love Sam's ruthlessly pragmatic. It's like, we don't have all the answers, but let's try and make it easier for the man or woman who's making that decision in, you know, town X or city Y tomorrow, try and help them make a better decision than they will if they base it on the current ways of thinking. And I mentioned the Welsh example because I think it was one of those ones where they just went, Let's just do this and see what happens. And it's not perfect. It needs changes, et cetera. But I think we need more of that kind of audacious decision making wherever it happens, whether it happens at a national government level or at a community level. So I you know, don't always have to work out all of the consequences and then find those people in that complex system that Bill described who can help you navigate that a little bit more, which is, I guess, what we try to do. Hey, Bill. Yeah, I've just put the link to the Future Generations Commissioner of Wales in, in the chat. And beneath it, I put the link there. One of the things I've been doing is working with them on and off. And they've been keen adopters of this Three Horizons way of thinking um, that I'm helping pioneer with others. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is that it's one of these really, really simple tools that helps anybody at any level from a community to the World Bank and everyone in between, convene a conversation in which all the voices about the future can be heard and in which you can explore the sort of issues that you were bringing up between where did our current first horizon pattern, as we call it, come from? Who's holding it in place? Where are the neglected and unattended voices that need to come into the room to build the new future? And what stories should we create about that future? And then what sort of innovations in the second horizon can start to build the new patterns. Um, and they've taken the tools. I'm trying to create a, a universal publicly available commons of practices and they've picked up on those and put them on their own website, but I could put in a link to those if people are interested. So my main work is how do we get 100 million of the next generation to be equipped with these tools for change and transformation from a, yeah, from a public commons of practice. Thank you very much. Sam or Indy, do you have any examples of either your own work or other people's that, that is inspiring in this space? Yeah, um, and I, I'm going to make a little bit of a muddled statement at the moment, but um, I think as a representative on this panel of a different generation, um, I want to build a little bit on, on what Indy was alluding to and, and Liz and Bill as well, in that the way democracy works right now in the West uh, quite simply does not work for for my generation. And, you know, I think the, the label that the economists gave us was generation rent. Um, and the reality is that, you know, we're supposed to vote for our representatives to take serious our, our issues or what we care about, whether it's, you know, our specific individual views or our concern about the planet and this impending <laughs> uh, three and a half degree temperature rise. And, you know, the reality is I might not live in that place for more than six months. Um, so why would I care who that representative is or what they stand for or know their background or their history? Um, but I definitely care about climate policy or I definitely care about um, AI policy and what's going to happen on a national level and where funding is going to be directed um, across, across the existing economy and what the metrics of that success are. And so how do I feed into that conversation with our political representatives as opposed to choosing someone from some party to represent me on all issues based on where I live in this moment in time. Um, and so I think that speaks a little bit to some of the work that I, I mentioned I'm, I'm trying to do with connecting these policymakers uh, with actual community representatives and finding ways to genuinely involve citizens in policy making um, in ways that is not simply a tick box exercise in ways that is not um, you know called public engagement where it's a one-way conversation about here's what we're going to do and maybe we'll take down some notes about your thoughts about it and then go off and do what we're going to do anyway um, but like 
genuine processes of, of engaging people across the, the full spectrum of what a community may look like um, and find it, finding ways to build those concerns meaningfully into the process, not just for today, but for, for the future and for future generations. Um, and I, I think some of it, as Liz keeps saying, is it's not necessarily rocket science. So many of these structures exist already. Um, and it is about you know, finding these opportunities to start to connect these people in places who just wouldn't cross paths otherwise. Thank you. Indy, do you have any um, examples or, or responses that you'd like to add? Yeah, no, I suppose I, I'm, I'm, I think this stuff is happening at a very, very fast rate. So I, you know, we're working with cities looking at how do you plant 400 million euros worth of urban forests. Now, you can't plant 400 million <laughs> worth of urban forests or improve because our current models actually see trees as liabilities. So this is tipping things over. Now, if you want to do retrofit, you can't do retrofit on the basis of energy, again, working with Core and Civic Square on transforming, actually, how do you do a community-driven retrofit model, which has a completely different power logic and capital structuring logic. We're starting to see things like uh, Bitcoin challenging reserve currency. I don't think this is, I think this is well and truly underway. Um, all the way from shifting discount rates. What is the discount rate of nature? Uh, is, does it have a discount rate? Um, I think the Dask of the re Review largely ignored that problem. Uh, looking at how we price carbon, we're pricing carbon with a discount rate right now, whereas if carbon was priced without a discount rate, it would be $27,000 a ton. So I, these, things are, these things are happening right now. We're looking at a self-sovereign house, a house that owns itself which isn't owned by third parties, which becomes a public utility in any way. These things are all in play simultaneously at speed. And, we're, and only by transforming and underneath this is soil. How do you own soil? Do you own soil? Shifting theories of ownership into not being nature being self-sovereign and we being in treaty, in treaty with it. These things are all being done and we're working on many of these things. And, but also there's a whole plethora of stuff happening around the world just challenging these fundamentals and thereby channeling the everyday things we see around us. And and that requires us to uh, work in different ways, but it's happening at speed. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that, that sense of the rate of change, that sense of the, the, well, the overwhelmingness, I think, of that is, is quite, it's, it can be very daunting and very um, exciting all at once, I think, to see the, this kind of work happening in response to the necessity, you know, as they say, uh, necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. Um, that kind of drives us to kind of move into those kinds of spaces and actually keep it on top of it. And because actually the monoculture of political debate and reporting and conversation so often makes us feel as though, and particularly I, I feel this, and I'm sure many do in relation to you know, the current UK government and stuff, you often feel like the big P politics just isn't, things aren't happening, you feel very disenfranchised by that process, not just by the process and structures, you know, as Sam has spoken about, but also about, about the fact that it feels like nothing is being done, but actually um, it, is, it is quite good to kind of know that, that it is being done. Now we're approaching the end of our time, and so I'm sorry we haven't got through everybody's question, but I do want to kind of quickly end, end on a kind of a hopeful note here um, uh, with, with Anna's question, which is around the world, around the word thriving, um, and um, Anna is interested to know, hear the panelists' definition of this notion of thriving. So I'd like to kind of end on that note, asking each of you in turn to kind of think about how, how might you define and understand thriving as a, either as something that we're already doing that we could do more of or something that you'd like to see more of in the future. So I'm going to go in the order that our speakers introduce themselves. So I'm going to start with Bill. Your take on the word thriving the bleak answer, a project I was involved in in Scotland, trying to see how, starting with the crisis in elder care in the winters, and how to stop people just getting into hospital, not getting out, inverted the system of social care, which used to go to people and say, what's the matter with you and which product do you need? And instead had the courage to sit down and have a cup of tea and say, not what is the matter with you, but what matters to you? And maybe what matters to you 
is meeting your friend in a cafe on a Thursday and getting into the supermarket. And then they put in place a whole sort of micro providers um, and marshal the latent resource of the community to serve that. So I think thriving is just what matters to you. Thank you very much. Indy. I'll go for the other planetary scale. Um, I think thriving for me is about but as I was saying, I think maybe we are at the emergence of a planetary consciousness, machine, human, ecological, planetary consciousness. And maybe we're one of the few sparks in the world of a planet becoming conscious. And maybe this consciousness is the next state of actually the kind of evolution of the universe. And if I talk about thriving, it is the thriving of thriving nature of that consciousness, of that in, and actually it's, it's, its development across the universe. I, I, I suppose I kind of go back into the 1960s. There was a fantastic um, philosopher, futurist, who used to, I think it's called the Kardashev scale, which talks about, you know, we are a 0.7 civilization using 0.7 of the energy of, of the earth. And we become a 0.1 civilization when we can use the whole energy of the earth and there's a point two which is the whole solar system a point three is a galaxy and point four is a kind of local cluster and point or five is a kind of whole universe i want us to let i i worry that we're we i worry we're losing our our our, our relationship with the universe and res, resorting to thinking like we are in the age of sustainability, uh, which is conservation, conserve, conserving our position. And our position currently is unconservable. There is only decline. We cannot sustain our current situation, as Bill rightly said, because we've lived in 200 years worth of growth. We've lived off petroleum, which is basically going to kill us. And we are, have to transcend a whole new theory of civilization. And we're in that, in that imagination. So I'm radically unconservist. Um, and I think we have to be radically uh, expansive of our thesis and our relationship with the universe and the possibility of what it means to be a civilization. That would be thriving. Thank you. Liz. I'm slightly regretting going after Indy now. <laughs> uh, wow. uh, yes, so I... As, as someone who works in an organization that has thriving in its name, you'd expect me to have a definition to trip off the tongue. But actually, interestingly, when we very much started, we started from Bill's position of, of, of thriving is, you know, what matters to you. So we, we start with that question of rather defining it and then that not being someone else's definition of thriving. And I think part of the reason for that slightly speaks to Indy's point about sort of planetary thriving. I think um, people often think of, you know, people often use the word thriving when they look at um, nature and they talk about, say, a garden, a beautiful garden or a beautiful meadow or something like that and say, <clears throat> excuse me, talk about how much, it, you know, nature is thriving. And a beautiful meadow is thriving because each bit of it is thriving. <clears throat> Sorry. So what it means to thrive if you're a buttercup is very different than what it means to thrive if you're a, a dandelion or a piece of grass. And, and I think each of us have some universal things that we need in order to thrive, but actually um, what it means for us individually to thrive is very much about what being, being enabled and having the conditions around us, whether that's you know, familial um, and, and local social conditions or societal conditions um, um, and planetary conditions to really be able to fulfill our our potential, our hopes, our, our you know, be, be protected from our fears, etc., or have the capacity to do that. So for me, it's very much about um, allowing us each to thrive and blossom, to use a kind of meadow analogy, in our own way. So it's not a blueprint for everybody. Thriving is this amount of money, this kind of health, da, 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 da. you know, that's very, very much the current system that we have. Can we deliver these objects to people? For me, it's very much about how do we in it create the collective conditions for us individually to thrive, for us to collectively thrive, which is a slightly different question, and for us to planetarily have that kind of consciousness that Indy's talking about. So we as a as a planet, as a galaxy, as a, you know, however far out we want to go on that one, um, can can thrive in the way that we we are naturally um you know made to do. Thank you. And Sam. Yeah, um 
I, I firmly believe that for innovation and new ideas to emerge that is going to help us meet this moment, it needs to happen and come from many spaces and many places and many people. And in order for that to be true, people's basic needs must be met. And then they need to have luxury, whether that be money or savings or relationships or, or resources or time in order to be able to think about and engage with these questions and to innovate and contribute to what our collective thriving uh, would, would ultimately look like. Thank you very much. Um, so we've come to the end of our time now, and, and um, I, for one, am almost um, <laughs> speechless as I attempt to try and process some of the many things that, 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 we, that we've covered today. And I just think that uh, I'm certainly going to take away that sense of the, the abundance um, and the mutuality of these things and, and how understanding that as a kind of a level of consciousness is kind of really empowering kind of way to go forward and think about this stuff. So I want to first thank our panel. Um, please do give a, a, a round of applause, virtual, remote or otherwise, um, for their time and their thoughts and their brains. Um, it's been it's been wonderful um, for me personally to kind of hear, hear this stuff happening. I also want to thank Anna and Adrian, our BSL interpreters, for keeping up with excited conversation and um, for my rambling diatribe attempts at questions as well. Um, and also Susie and Juliet for um, running the chat and keeping everything um, under control. Uh, thank you for listening. And I'm really sorry we didn't get to all of those conversations. I think there's a real thirst about how we, how we do put some of this stuff into practical action. I can see that happening in the chat and in, 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 in that kind of conversation. And what I want to kind of reiterate, I guess, is that we see the Hopeful Futures program as, as a start in trying to answer some of those questions for our little bit of the world, our little part of the system. And we're hoping that this seminar series, which does run across until about December, that next year as well, and in the future, we're going to be continuing to try and kind of build on some of this wisdom and some of these, um, some of these thoughts um, in relation to the work that, that we do as well. So our next talk is on the 16th of September. And as a general rundown of the kind of stuff that we will be covering, we're going to be covering, um, we've got some more kind of on the ground examples. So that conversation about what's actually happening, there'll be some more of that hopefully covered in a bit more depth next time. After that, um, I believe we're talking about post-colonialism and power and thinking about how we think about social justice in those ways in the futures that we design. And then we've also got the final one really returns to this idea of ecological crisis as well and how we respond um, to all of those kinds of challenges laid out here. But as I say, these are, these talks are just the beginning of bringing together um, some of this constellation of work that is out there and to see if there are new synergies that can, that can spark some new imagination and new ways to kind of think about thriving um, and, and, and growing, but not necessarily in that way. So um, once again, thank you everybody very much. Um, we have recorded this. It will be up on, um, I believe, Orchard's YouTube channel or our YouTube channel um, in the near future. So we will um, we will let attendees know hopefully um, about all of that um, very soon. Oh, look, there's a link already there. Um, yeah, and if you want to continue the conversation, you can get in touch with us via the uh, British Mobile Create Bar and website. And um, thank you very much. And I hope you will get a chance to enjoy um, sunny afternoon, which appears to have arrived here in Bristol at least. So thank you very much. <laughs>